Hey, hey, everybody. How we doing today? This is the inaugural, is that the word? I think it might be the word. It might, it may not be the right pronunciation. Inaugural um, stream for um, Drum Geek uh, Vodcast. I'm super excited to be here. Uh, if you've got any uh, questions or if you've got any comments, if you want to comment on how shiny my head is in one way or another, you can put that in chat. Um, uh, in one way or another, if you want to comment how gray my beard is, that can happen. Or if we want to talk about some uh, drums, this is the place to do that as well. Um, so first and foremost, the important thing on our very, very first kind of tester and uh, saying hi to everybody is probably to introduce the man behind the man um, of Drum Geek, um, the infamous, I think is the term, um, Sean Mitchell. Let's bring him in right now. How's that sound? Boom. Hola. Hey, Sean. How are you, Paul? Good, bud. How are you doing? Really good. I'm yeah, excited been... to be here. We've been talking about this for a while, haven't we? Mm -hmm. A couple months. This has been exciting. I, mm -hmm. I appreciate you uh, you getting me in on this and, uh, you know, making well, me the man behind the man, I guess. Only talented, only talented people on this show other than myself. Oh, I like that. You know? I like that. Okay. I, well, I, that... I need I need talented people to, to appear so that it's quality. Well, if you say it, it's the truth. I don't All know right. if you know that. That's of awesome. Uh, tell us a bit about yourself, Sean. What do you, uh, you you're you're a drummer? I take it. I think so. That's what people say. <laughs> That's exactly. <laughs> do you can do you consider yourself a drum geek? Like in all honesty, like with with the the, the term of geek, there's a difference between playing drums, hitting mm -hmm. the tubs, and getting paid. And mm -hmm. knowing every lug that's on a Ludwig snare. Right. Or, and and yeah. obviously in between. Where do you say? Right. Uh, well, behind the snare, actually, on my throne. But uh, I, yeah, I would, I guess I would ter uh, term myself as kind of, yeah, kind of a drum geek. I just like the term drum geek because I think that, that it just implies that you're so into that uh, subsect of content. But I don't. Yeah. yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that I'm good about geeking out about. Mm. Like I don't. I don't really know what type of lugs are on a Ludwig snare. Um, How about this? Do you but, know somebody who knows those answers? Oh, for sure, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I think. I think it's just uh, the geekiness comes into the. I, I'm interested in drumming. I'm interested in drummers, and I'm interested in what makes us tick. Yeah. I think that's that's probably more interesting to me than most. Because I, I think there's a personality traits that come with drumming. Sure. Yeah. So I think it's just interesting because you have multiple people who are playing this instrument and they come from various walks of life. And yet we have this one thing we can all sort of agree on that mm -hmm. we, we like, we enjoy playing the drums. Yeah. So there's a, there's a, there's an excuse to create a conversation. And I think in like in the climate of our society right now, where we're so segregated with right and left, yeah, it's good to have a center that say, well, you know what we can agree on is it's pretty badass to be a drummer. Well, the good thing is, and I've, I've known you for many years is that us drummers love to be social and yes. g getting together in community, like community meetups, whether it's coffee meetups yeah. or whatever. But yeah. really, the the good thing about those meetups is we really love pumping each other up and telling each other how awesome we are. Well, so and the motivation we, is overwhelming, yeah. right? And we assume the whole world knows what we're talking about. Well, that goes without saying. Right? I think you're right. <laughs> haven't haven't what, you what seen you mean, my what YouTube you mean, channel? Yeah. <laughs> what do you mean you don't know Dom Famulero? Come on, I mean, everyone knows. You, yeah, that's exactly it. But it does feel it does feel kind of good. Much like um, much like our our guest today, as a matter of fact, who's mm. going to be hanging out with us, is that. Uh, the band he played with, you know, so a few of my favorite tracks are actually kind of the obscure ones that were like track 11, you know what I mean, mm, and track 10. Yeah. And it kind of makes me feel that special because I know those tracks. And I feel the same way about drumming is that when somebody's like, um, uh, who's your favorite? Steve Jordan. Who's that guy? I'm like, oh. right. I, I kind of right. feel borderline insulted. But on the other hand, I'm like, he's mine. Like I within drummers yeah. know that. Yeah. But. But the average Joe Schmo and, guitarist probably doesn't and, know that. And right? to me, interesting, like, that's why I think these people are the better. Because, like, say someone like Steve Gadd, who was told by a contemporary that, oh, I didn't even realize you're on the gig. And Steve thanked him. Right. Because he was playing for Paul Simon. 
Yeah. So, yeah. you know, he sort of took that as a compliment. It's like, awesome. I, I, I'm, I did my job then. I wasn't the Steve yeah. Gadget. That's and really I think, funny. Yeah. Yeah. And I just, I think it, there's a new, it's a level of professionalism, maturity, uh, you know, virtuosity that you don't need the rub as it were. Yeah. That, you know, you're that drummer from like lots of, lots of prolific musicians walk around and no one has a clue who they are. No, there is an, there is an undersided compliment that I did receive once where uh, <laughs> I, I played a gig afterwards. Somebody was like, man, that band was amazing. That drummer was solid. Yeah. And I, and I was like, that, that was me. Yeah. He, and this guy was that guy, man. Thank mm -hmm. you for the compliment. But also mm -hmm. it was a compl assault that you didn't know that it was this guy. Yeah. that was sitting up there for the past couple hours so <laughs> well and and it's fine. you know <laughs> case in point you have a lot of musicians or a lot of bands now that are out uh playing and like no i mean the average person that goes to see sage see journey would yeah. they know like would they actually know who the original drummer of journey was probably that's not a really good point that's a really um, really good point and they're they don't know that there's been like you know a million lineup changes and there's been like probably four or five drummers go through journey yeah, so, absolutely. Or like, you know, the Guess Who are touring through America with like, I think Gary's the only original member. Yeah, I guess so. The most marketed person is the, the person on everybody's locker door, I guess, is the most important person that's actually in the band and part of the market, right? Yeah. It's, it's not like, uh, um, you know, when all of Bon Jovi was marketed as that's the team. All four right. of them, you need them all up on your locker or it's a no-go. Right. right, right, and it and it became headline news if some band member left. Right, very, very different. Yeah, um, yeah. And so there's something. I mean, there's something totally different between being celebrity, being recognized, and then just being artistic and being okay with that, and yeah, or not yeah. not needing the the adulation because you find the you find the the fulfilling fulfillness through doing your craft, which is kind of or then or you know, do people see that? Yeah. yeah and, and exactly and is like does it matter if if someone doesn't see it then that's not your that's not your uh it's not your 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 peeps yeah good point right yeah right um you and i could talk for hours and then we have let's be very very clear we have yeah um i would like to bring in our our guest who's going to be hanging out with us today um yeah. impromptu short notice and this guy's awesome in the minute and a half that i chatted with him right before we came live um I don't know, and I said this before, I don't know if the internet, if you're in chat, by the way, say hello, because it'd be great to, to know who's out there and what's going on. Um, I don't know if the internet's going to be able to handle all of the shine, the awesome shyness that we've got. <laughs> we might get reported, because um, the three of us are pretty good looking guys, but that's neither here nor there. Mm -hmm. Um. I would like to bring in um, this drummer. Uh, he's, a, he's a motivator. He's an educator, uh, producer. He's a, the drummer in, in the very notable band, uh, The Crash Test Dummies. And I'm wondering, Mitch, um, has this pandy been measured out in coffee spoons? There you go. No? Yes? Oh, you would have to bring that up. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Um, um, yeah, yeah. I would have to ask uh, Jean Paul about that. Oh, <laughs> fair enough. Oh, I are because I'm wearing pajamas in the in the daytime, and oh, only <laughs> only I have to say, and I'm sure that it probably comes up in multiple conversations that you've got. But uh, it's an inside joke for literally the last twenty years um, with my wife and I that when one of us have a day off, we're have we, pajamas in the daytime. Like we actually say it. So it's part of our vocabulary that we're going to be wearing our pajamas in the daytime. But over the past couple of years, due to the pandy, which is what I call it, um, there's been a lot of pajamas in the daytime. How have you been for the past couple of years? I've been fine. I, 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 uh, for me, the, the, the journey has been a little uh, most. Um, the day that the pandemic hit, the the, the day that the world stopped, the day that they said, uh, everybody stay home. Uh, I was going in for surgery. And uh, oh. so my, my dog, as we were wheeling into the surgery room, they really lucky this is going on today because tomorrow 
all my surgeries are being pushed away. And at the time, I really didn't know what was going on, and I thought maybe this was going to be a two or three week thing. And uh, so <clears throat> I was able to sit at home and, and work, work from home. I mean, I wasn't doing too much for the first couple of months. But the, the, you know, our tour was uh, a bunch of other things that I was doing music that canceled. But for whatever reason, the film industry went through the roof. And I spent a lot of time composing music for uh, documentaries, television series, movies, etc., etc. Et I, you know, I went from playing on stage to sitting in my studio, and uh, I was yeah. as busy as you can. Be. As a fact, up until about fifteen minutes ago, was over. All that stuff. So, uh, uh, and I had a very like yours and was salt and white. Yours is not salt and white. Well, we might be losing. Yeah. We're, we're losing you a little bit. We're, we're missing some stuff. Uh, sorry. Let me see. I doubt that it's the important there. stuff. Because I've set up. Oh, before. terrible. We we haven't even hit the important stuff. The, the relatable stuff. I like it. Uh, you, you, yeah. You've hit home. You've hit home right is that everybody got sent home to their home studios to songwrite and to compose. And um, it's been a massive, you know, increase in electronic music these days for sure. But would you say, you know, I, I say this softly, but would you have gotten into so, so much more composition now or double down on it if you know, the world hadn't collapsed on itself as it is, or were you really motivated at the time to, to get into it regardless? Oh, I was, I was going full steam uh, b before it happened. As a matter of fact, the, the surgery was supposed to be happening on some downtime that we had uh, from the band. So we had just finished touring in the States. We were supposed to be coming home. We were going to have a month off, and then I was going to take off to Europe. And in that month, I, I, had, I had a list of things that I needed to accomplish. And uh, I, I, it was unbelievable how much stuff I was, I was sweating. I was full of anxiety, uh, wondering how I was going to get through it all. Uh, and then everything changed. And, and I just, uh, you know, rather than thinking about my, the limitation of my time, uh, my, my time span just grew and I was able to take on more. Mm -hmm. I'm not as affected as, uh, you know, I have a lot of friends that were out there and they, and they like their income stopped overnight because that's what they do. Uh, yeah. I didn't have that unfortunate event happened to me good did you um I, I know that you do a lot of uh motivation and um uh going to schools and education did that uh that's probably slowed down a bit over this but have you had opportunity to do any of that online with any uh kids any type of uh engagement that way it came to a grinding halt yeah uh, as as i mean i don't you know that um However, uh, having said that, I, 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 a lot of my friends, uh, in, in, let's say on the motivational side, on the, uh, on the band side, everybody's scrambling for a while in terms of what we're going to do, how we're going to stay current. Uh, and, and they started doing Facebook posts and, and Facebook concerts and, and uh, all kinds of live streaming. And I didn't feel the need to, to do that. I really didn't that I was busy enough as it was, why not leave that space for, for those who, who really needed that space? Mm. Um, mm. So <clears throat> I, I really it, it didn't take up for me to, to contribute in way. Gotcha. Was there a, uh, sorry, I'm hip firing questions because I'm really liking what you're saying. Um, was there any, um, Anybody in particular that maybe you kind of passed the torch to that, you know, who would, would, did get into live streaming that you kind of, um, what's the word I'm looking for, took, took in their content in any way? Was there anybody inspiring you? Um, no, I, 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 would, I would say no, not, not at the time. Only, only because I really felt that everybody was scrambling. I think a lot of people made a lot of mistakes, uh, mm. you know, in terms of, 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 of getting it there and putting themselves out there. And they weren't really prepared. They were scrambling. And uh, yeah. I didn't want to spend, I, I, I could only spend so much time looking at Facebook. 
Uh, I can only spend right. so much time. So, you know, whatever, whatever time that's going to be, it's going to be a ton of time well spent. Uh, there's, there were a lot of people, however, that had the time to, to peruse and, and, and look and, and listen and do those kinds of things. Um, I, was that a mistake for me? I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't think so. Not as of yet, anyway. Hmm. Hmm. That it's interesting how you're you're right. It, there was this divide that happened where everybody that did not, that wasn't online, suddenly felt a necessity to get online, in any capacity, good or bad. They just needed to get on there, and it, I guess it's kind of like record deals. Some stuck, and some didn't, and majority of it didn't, and uh, and that we all know that there's a few standing that that really took took waves and maybe had good marketing behind it but really nowadays people are like well we're done with that we don't we can close down the the podcast we can close down the live streams now we're getting back to normal life and then all of a sudden normal life gets flipped up again and they're like well, should we what do we do do we wind things back up again what do we do you know it's this yeah, sense you know of I, I think, confusion that's, I, that's I, occurring I, as creators right yeah I think it might be safe to say that the, that uh, I mean, going back and reassessing your question, mm -hmm. and you know, I would say that some of the people um, that were motivating me, may, maybe there was a few people, but they were they had a presence before the pandemic, and uh, you know, like I was listening to I was, I was listening to Rogan, I was listening to Jordan Peterson, I was listening to those people before the pandemic hit, and so therefore, um, you know, I didn't get really into that. I also think that. I need to be somewhat for, or we need to be somewhat for doing because people didn't know what to expect. They didn't know what was going on. A lot of people, my livelihoods being canceled. I, I, right. My days are dead. They're gone. I can't even, I can't even go watch someone. Right. In those kind of situations, people can and they, they, they make decisions that maybe aren't the best at the time. Yeah, good point. Uh, I'll I'll do a quick quick pivot here, and that um, I I brought up the interview that you and Sean did many many moon ago, and um, if you if, bye, <laughs> his internet crashed. Oh boo! Oh well, now it's you and me, Sean. Yikes. <clears throat> that's come a, back. That's, that's all good. The, oh, yeah. He'll come back. That's the danger of technology, right? You Absolutely. Technology and live uh, television. Oh, there he is. Oh, oh. It's back. Bring you back in here, bud. There ah, we go. You disappeared. Yep. Yeah, uh, inter internet's sketchy. Because yeah. I don't know if you know, everybody's on the internet right now. <laughs> Everybody is on the internet. Uh, I, I wanted to quick, quick fire uh, ask you. Um, if you haven't noticed, I'm a bit of a nerd, and the the um, live stream that I host, we celebrate all things retro. We celebrate all things growing up when it came to like toys, cartoons, TV shows, um, video games, all that type of stuff. But uh, I saw a interview between you and Sean many many while ago, and you were wearing a Star Wars shirt in the interview. I was. You were wearing a Star Wars shirt. And uh, you'd mentioned that you weren't a big Star Wars fan, but the Star Wars shirt um, had Darth Vader behind the drum kit. Would I you know the one. Yes. You know the one. Perfect. Would Maybe judging from your answer just now, during the pandemic, there's been an onslaught of Marvel movies, Star Wars movies, like just sci-fi has just been hitting us hard. Um, are, you, are you a Star Wars fan yet or no? No, am I a Star Wars fan? I would I would probably say that when Star Wars came out, <laughs> now yes. like, which is which is probably before some of the people watching this uh, were born, but when the Star Wars thing came out, um, you know, I, I would say the first three episodes, I would have been a Star Wars fan because I think at that particular point in time, it kind of aligned with where. Uh, where the world was, what people were watching, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, beyond Return of the Jedi, uh, I, I, I fell off the planet. Um, <laughs> well, I, some, would, some would say you fell off at the right time. Like that, was, that was the glorious times. 
you know. Yeah, I you know they they were they were great. I mean, just just the technology, the you know the you know everybody you know flocking out to see the movies and all that kind of stuff. It really was it was a, a very nostalgic time. But I, I do remember, mm, boy, maybe sometime around 90, 1997 or something like that. Um, I, I had a really really bad headache. I was I was sick, and my wife went out and uh, got all the star wars movies for me like the, I, the and i'm only talking the first three. Oh, sure and, yeah that, and, that's all yeah and i re-watched them and and i thought wow like what a pie of earnestness that was Whew. um and i and i i that was it. it that was it was over for me at that particular point in time yeah so you so let's be clear you made the strategic decision to say that is it folks that is the best we're not going to get better. I like it. And then some would say that it started wavering all over the place. But you got out at the perfect time. You pulled your stocks out of the market right at the perfect time. Is that kind of the deal? Maybe. I think I think in my in my sci-fi world, I, I'm going to I'm going to rebring up the comment you said earlier and that when someone talks to you about certain tracks on records, you you tend to like track 11. Or, or or the hidden track or the one that no one else listens to everybody bought the thing for the when it comes to the world of sci-fi i am the same way uh cool. I, you know as you know right now raised by wolves as I, I think one of the great one of the best sci-fi things out there but you know that's me and and that's me in in my in my movie world i am a movie buff so yeah well i Raised by Wolves is excellent uh, place to be sci-fi wise. I think second season has just been introduced um, as well that they're doing it. So great series. What what have you been watching over the past while? Is there certain series that have captivated you? Could be anything. Um, well, I would say first of all, you know, Raised by Wolves is always yeah. always a great one. Um, I I mean, I got I I got caught up a little bit in in Yellowstone. Uh, I was, I, I, I was, and I, and I think more than the story of Yellowstone, I got caught up in the care. I got caught up in Beth's character. Um, yeah. I, I, I thought, like, I just thought, really, that was some like some great acting. I was, there was just some phenomenal acting going on there. Um, those are the kinds of things that tend to attract me. Uh, I think Euphoria. If you've seen Euphoria, heard, uh, but we haven't started it yet. Yeah. <clears throat> So I mean that's that's just another one. Just the the visuals are are fantastic. They're really really well done. And uh, you know right now um, I think Succession is is leading my my way through the day. Um, I I enjoy Succession. Succession the the story arc of every single character is annoyingly good. I guess. And yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. How can so many people be so miserable all the time? Totally. That's exactly. <laughs> Yeah, my, my, my wife is, I, I don't know if she's pulled the plug on it, but she's just like, I can't deal with this family, these dynamics. This this is too much for me. So I think she's given me the go ahead, which we can all agree, everybody <laughs> can agree, is that you need permission to go forward in a series w without your loved one. Um, she's given me yeah. permission to move forward in that show without her. And uh, I don't know how I'm going to feel about that five episodes in when she decides to get back in. So, right. Yeah. You gotta go back. Well, she'll have to go yeah, back in her own time to sort out what she just missed. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. that's true. Well, yeah. she was Sean? nice enough to do that with Downton Abbey for me. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Tony, my, yeah. my the my life, Tony has been doing Downtown Abbey for a long time. Mm. Um, yeah. I think I think she almost made it all the way through. And that's one that I've been her permission to watch because I just I just don't have the time. It it's good. Actually. I just finished it for the third time. I was just going to ask Sean, what are you watching? Yeah, what do you got? Well, that, I was watching that. Wait, yeah. you watch I, you watch the entire series three times? Yeah, yeah. I'm actually a big fan. I really love. I love. I love the whole, the whole everything about it. I love it, and it's just to me, yeah. it's just it's just an interesting take on kind of that time and that era and what Julian brings to the table as a kind of a creative writer. Yeah. There are times where I feel like he just rushes through the plot for the sake of moving the, the script along, but I get sure. that. I get that there needs to be, you know, there were time timelines, but um, 
I just it just tells me that people are still people and nothing's really fucking changed in the last 200 years um other than our dress and the way we get around and how we communicate and the pandemics yeah. that we face are we still face them the same way they're relatable that way yeah you're right uh, yeah absolutely i think if you didn't know someone was 200 years old and you spoke with them you wouldn't have a clue how old they were <clears throat> yeah, interesting so yeah. i just i in when you to, to me when you i love when you frame things that are not maybe necessarily within your ethos the things you know about and the times you know about and you maybe pay attention or that you get the lesson better because it's not like it's not your revolution so you're going oh okay that must have been really hard for them back mm -hmm. then like there's a lot of things that put into got put into play back then that i see now you know and and to the point like it was interesting when you mentioned the pandemic mitch experienced it one way i became a father in the pandemic so i see i see life now and the whole different way my son doesn't know the world outside of a pandemic he's yeah. he was born into a pandemic world he, he will never not know COVID. yes and that's to me is prolific because jagger's reality is not my reality and yet we share realities so i just it's i find that's what i find interesting about the show and the reason i actually started watching it again was because i couldn't think of anything i wanted to watch I'm kind of a channel surfer and it's something just really has to grab me. Yes. And I, I just, I really need stuff that's like probably really cerebral. Yeah. And uh, I just, sometimes I think that, you know, maybe it's not as cerebral as I'd like to think, but that's one I've, and then I'd really been uh, digging Emily in Paris for, I don't know why I'm watching that one, oh, but he's gone. He'll come back. Oh, it, gone. um, yeah. it, because it has, like I'm not a I'm not a fashionista and I've never been to Paris, but I again when you're not when you're thrown outside of your reality and you get to experience other people's reality, yeah. I'm drawn to that. Yeah, I think uh, if you don't know the topic very well, then it can be entertaining and educational. Yeah, but absolutely. you know, we we can talk about movies that have drum oriented <laughs> stuff in it that mm -hmm. probably frustrate the three of us because we're like that's not accurate that that kit came out well after that movie is supposed to take place like everything about that frustrates us because we maybe we just know it too well but i i don't know the the, the trials and tribulations of living in 1930 right um, so right i'm learning something every single episode maybe right and and that's probably the 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 expanded version is as if you did watch it with someone who maybe was aware of that time frame or like I watched backdraft with my dad, who's a retired firefighter. And I mean, yeah. then, you know, you got to be careful what you ask for too, because I mean, it was completely ruined for me. Like nothing about that movie was totally. accurate. It was just, you know, and it's, I mean, that's Hollywood though. That's, that's what we agree to much like star Wars franchise. We agree, you know, won't need this for a second, put that yeah. over there. Suspend which, disbelief. Yeah, yeah. Which is, and I think that's okay. I think that's a muscle you can work. And, and that's, you know, those are chess presses you need to do is the cre creative side, because then otherwise you wouldn't have, you know, the, the, the franchises like star Wars or, or even, you know, tr uh, classic novels for that matter. Like that was their star Wars for that day. And, interestingly when mitch brought up the first three and that's around the time i was born and yep. i you know i didn't mind yep. i didn't mind the prequels but i also saw kind of in a way that much as i watched jagger play when he's on like he's he gravitates to devices like everyone else and again he's we model to our children so i mean if i'm on the phone jagger of course gonna want that it's like what's that dad's obsessed with that let me have that right um but he's a different guy when he is playing with something that he doesn't have to make it work. It just works. Hmm. So when he's on the phone, he's different than when he's like creating, like when he's playing with his toys or if he's playing with his, his he's got a couple stuffed uh, dogs he likes. And when he's engaging with a book, he's a different guy. And I just, when I saw Star Wars, the prequels, I just thought, you know, it's, it's that old adage. Sometimes when you lack things or when you don't have that ultimate budget, you come up with creative ways to tell your story. Mm. And that sometimes is what's the, so good about that is that, you know, some of the, especially some of the older music or some of the older albums is that 
we didn't have those tools. So we had to get there without those tools. Yes. And sometimes having the tools is like, yeah, I mean, it's good, but it might be a little bit overkill or it's like in the case of the first prequel, it's like, wow, what was that? It was just too much. Right. Yeah. You, the, the celebration of, uh, of, of the, the past, you, you've, you've hit it right. Cause I was going to bring up like, <clears throat> like me, there's a celebration of the nineties right now in particular happening, mm. right? Nineties and maybe early 2000, that big tour, uh, that big festival was just launched or announced yesterday. If you didn't see it in social media, uh, all these pop punk bands and everything's a huge festival happening in Las Vegas. Um, and there's 60 bands playing over 12 hours. Hmm. Wow. 60. Which, which every fan is probably going, cool, take my money. Everybody who knows what it takes to run a production is going, that's not actually possible, in case you're wondering. Like, the time just doesn't work out. <laughs> right. But some, but the average person doesn't know that. The reason why that's important is because people our age may, might have some disposable money. You know what I mean? And we want to be able to live off of nostalgia and go down rabbit holes and um, I, I find myself recently going down rabbit holes of the 90s because that was kind of the prime time. Mm. But 90s music videos are kind of a big deal to me. And Crash Test Dummies is a perfect example of that where th there, there's an era of time where the, the music videos told stories and the visuals complemented the song mm. or, or was a companion to the song. Mm. And um, yeah, Crash Test Dummies has phenomenal videos. Big fan, whether it's Peter Pumpkinhead or it's um, mm, or it's uh, Afternoons of Coffee Spoons. Like they all had really cool visuals to it. Mitch, you talk a bit about experiencing making music videos in in the nineties. Mm. Well, music videos were primarily record. I would say I think all, all one of our videos were created by. Oh, yeah. Every time that we think about putting a record company would come to us, they'd say, you know, in order to be accessible these days, especially with much and MTV, we need to have a video. That, that was that's what's the song? And what's the video? And uh, we would the song, and we would have uh, probably three or four little bits. On, on an idea, right? Then they would come. They would come to us with these fantastic ideas of, of what they felt was an interpretation, an accurate interpretation of what the song was. And in each, every time, they added zero. Um, and we would always turn to Ellen, and Ellen would say, "Look, I've got an idea." And we would inevitably end up going with whatever her idea was. And I, I think an inside track right, as to, to what the songs were. Um, you know, with Crash Test Dummies in particular, the, 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 the songs, I think, touch a lot of people. And one of the things that we get from people, hey, like this, you know, mm -mm -mm, like I was that kid in school. And I was I was a little bit different, and, and uh, you know, I was ostracized for it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, coming from that, um, it's it's not necessarily a personal story as much as it is an observation of life. And so um, when Ellen would grab these things, she wouldn't make them overly personal about what was going on. She wanted to make video also be an observation, but also to incorporate the, I guess you could say, the, the tongue-in-cheek uh, of, you know, if we wouldn't have been called Precious Dummies, we would Right, so uh, yeah. we, we wanted to take those those concepts and what the videos were, and make them, uh, you know, the least amount of earnestness possible. <laughs> and uh, so, so doing that in the time, uh, it, I mean, it's a trophy. It, it didn't, there's no way that you could get there and have a video. The record companies just weren't interested in whatever you were doing at any point at any time. Yeah. Oh, all good. Oh, 
Did we lose you? We're good? I think he might be. Unless he's really holding still. He is he can he can hold still really well. Yeah, without blinking. As drummers, we are incapable of doing that. Yeah. I'm gonna take him out for a second and he'll make his way back when I see him moving. You yeah. and I for a moment. Um yeah, that's interesting about nineties videos. Do you mm. go down those rabbit holes about nineties videos? Uh yeah. Do you do you have the uh Yeah I'll bring, him, I'll, I'll bring Mitch back in. Yeah. No worries. That's good. Spot spat, what's the spotty internet? Totally yeah. good. Um so, so just I, I know you asked Sean another question, but no, no, uh, continue on. Yeah, those those were those were the. It, it, there's no way that you could survive in the music industry if you didn't have a video to back up whatever it was that you were doing. Yeah. So you were even for some of the songs that we did release a video for, we weren't necessarily keen on releasing the video because we weren't coming up with with ideas that we felt uh, supported what we wanted, you know, what we wanted to portray. So you know, case in point. Uh, my own sunrise, which was a track, was 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 a bit of an obscure track, but the record company wanted to get behind it and release it. We ended up going with someone else's idea of what that should be, and the only reason that that person made it into the running was that it was far enough out there that it seemed interesting to us. And mm -hmm. it started off, you know, like this was the number that they started off with <laughs> for a budget. And then after about three days of shooting, the budget like went to six times, uh, at least six times to what the original budget was was put out for, and and so that that was just craft yeah. services. I hear you yeah, yeah. exactly. You know, and for us, that was just another no. This is why we don't go outside of, of our own circle. Um, yeah. Now th that's just for us. I, I think a lot of other a lot of other people have had better uh, results than than we did, uh, but. I don't miss that much. I don't, I don't, you know, that I'm going to go back and I'm going to say the same thing that I said about Star Wars. And I, I, it's very nostalgic. I do remember those times. I remember making the videos. I remember that they were fun. I remember uh, going to much music or going to MTV and have people all, you know, buzzing about what we were doing. And I, you know, and I, and I would say that, you know, which is, which is, what's the one that we had the most fun with? Well, probably Al Yankovic, uh, you know, Weird Al when he did a cover of. <laughs> there we go. It's yeah. on my, it's on my list to mention it to you. I'm very interested in that aspect of it as well, but sorry, continue on your thought there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, and that, that to me was, was the most fun because someone was coming along and, and, uh, you know, taking the piss out of us and, and, you know, he was nice enough to call and say, you know, this is what I want to do, which he did for everybody. Uh, he's just a perfect gentleman. He just called up and said, hey, I want to take the piss out of you with one of your tunes. And, and I just just I want your permission to do so. If you're not going to give me permission, then I'm just going to move on to something else. You know, no hard feelings. Yeah. And and we, we said, are you kidding? Like, Al Yankovic, you want to do one of our tunes? <laughs> you know, it's become, it's become kind of an honor to have him you know mm. do a parody of your song absolutely so, so i, I did wonder flattery it really is i so i want oh sorry I, I wondered about the process of his interest and, and and if we can face some facts here that to have the name crash test dummies was much like bare naked ladies it, it, you you already have the persona that you're fun you're you know you're you're not the average band and that you can already make fun of yourselves a tiny bit um so, you know, when I was thinking about 90s videos, just to harken back to that really quickly, having videos that were very serious nature would be off brand for you, I think. So finding that medium ground would be important. But on the other side, having Weird Al do a parody of your tune is kind of pinnacle. That seems like awesome, right? Oh, so yeah. To, to get, yeah, to get that call, how did, how did you guys feel about that? Go for it. Oh, uh, when we got the call, as I just said to you, you know, yeah. We, we were, I think we were on the bus when we got the call and asking, saying, our manager said, hey, got a call from Weird Al, wants to know how you guys would feel about, you know, us cover or him covering. Mm -mm -mm. And it's everybody just instantly went, what? Are you kidding? <laughs> yes. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, we couldn't wait. We, we were just sitting around waiting for to, to see the finished product. It was, it was phenomenal. And I mean, simultaneously, I think, as it was released or within a week that that, that particular song was released from Al's version, 
uh, we did a thing with him at Much Music, right? So he performed with us. We performed that tune at Much Music. At, uh, I can't remember what it's called. When it was, they opened up the, the, the doors and yeah. you know, spewed oh. out on the street. Yep. And, uh, you know, he came out with, like, the Brad wig. And, and uh, <laughs> yeah, it, you know, it was, it was phenomenal. Okay. And, uh, yeah. you know, a lot of people, I think, at the time were questioning as to whether or not we were insulted by that. And, and yeah. we, and right away, you know, if you thought that we were insulted by Al covering one of our tunes, then you kind of missed the point behind what Crash System is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, because I, I wondered, you know, and, and you can probably, you, you can speak directly on behalf of it, but when Weird Al does one of your tunes, um, d does that put a, like a, the Eye of Sauron, does it put the spotlight back on the band? And now you got to deliver. You got to come up with new marketing plans. You got to like if you were if you were just kind of on neutral touring, and all of a sudden you're like, oh my god, okay, all eyes are on us again. We got to monopolize on this. Did you feel any of that? Uh, I would, you know, oh, no. that, that feeling, that's where that's that's has a, a very uh, distinct fan base and uh, you know they they would yep. they would recognize that for what he does doesn't necessarily affect what we do other than people coming up to us going hey how did you feel about weird Al covering of your tunes um, you know and and of, and of course I mean you know uh, to, to go back and say the the all eyes on you when we played Saturday Night Live we we uh, uh, Chris Farley was was a was a great fan of the band, and anywhere that we would go, that Chris Farley was, he would show up at one of our shows and say, "Hey, man, I want to introduce you guys. Is that cool?" And so you know, we're we're in Aspen, Colorado, and and we're just getting ready to go out, and we, I don't know, we've got ten thousand people out there, or whatever, and then all of a sudden, you hear a knock at the door, and 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 it's you know, it's it's Chris Farley, and he says, "Hey, I want to introduce you guys," and now <clears throat> having said that. If that would have happened with Al, we would have greeted it exactly the same way. We would have said, absolutely, we'll get a microphone, we'll we'll fly in stuff for you so that you can show up at our shows. Uh, that would be amazing. Uh, because it really, in, in the true nature of Crash Test Dummies, just, you know, the, the parody could not have been a better thing. Oh, mm. brilliant. And, and it's a very obvious, um, you're talking about like wanting to invite people up or the be be okay with something not going perfect a lot of the time as well because i even see um you know a lot of live footage where I, I don't know if mistakes are happening on stage but brad will turn around and kind of just smile and kind of giggle at somebody and just there, there was already this vibe on stage that you aren't taking yourself with all due respect you aren't taking yourself highly seriously and you're just you're just a group of people hanging out on stage playing some tunes and if the audience wants to listen they can listen right yeah i would say to that that um i'm going to make the distinction in that we take the music very seriously sure. we take ourselves not very seriously mm -hmm. right. so that that would be yeah, that would be that would be the thing is that i i would say that one of the one of the things that i've always enjoyed about you know being a crash test dummy so to speak is that everybody every night every song walks out onto that stage and says i'm going to play this song the best that i've ever played it uh when someone makes a mistake when someone makes a flub when someone forgets their keys in their car no one turns around and gives them the the look you know yeah. Uh, yeah. it's like haha you made a mistake nah, 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 nah. uh it's and it's and it's that's that's not taken seriously but everybody's everybody's out on that stage saying, "I'm just I'm going to play this like it's the last time I'm ever going to play it." So that is taken seriously, but we are not. Perfect. I'm glad you clarified that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. You you said Saturday Night Live, and I'm I'm uh, I was intrigued with Jay Letterman or Jay Letterman, Jay Letterman, uh, Dave Letterman. When you're, are you on killing Letterman. two birds with one stone. Uh, sorry, I know. <laughs> Yes, exactly. As I say, it's a comp assault to somebody. Um, uh, David Letterman, I, I do have to ask this as drummers. 
we know that he walks up to the drummer after every performance and says, hey, I like your drum kit or did are those your drums? Did he did he say anything to you after your performance? Uh, yeah. Uh, well, first of all, David Letterman's a drummer. I don't, you know, not a lot of people know that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, he loves to play drums, and uh, the, the one, one, the one thing is, is that before every show, uh, the stage goes when, when the stage goes dark. Uh, Anton walks over, and, and it used to be Steve Jordan, but you know, Anton would go over and give him the sticks, and Letterman would just like play for an hour. Uh, wow. He just, he just loves to play, and then so he always has an interest. Uh, always wants to say hi to the drummer and mm -hmm. i mean but uh, of course the nature of the show is you know he drives in does the show he's got to go blah 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 so you know the, the the handshake is is pretty much as far as it goes and then wow. you know every time that, and and for us every time that we've played letterman which is three times i think uh, we're usually flying in from somewhere else and the show tapes at five o'clock and and no soon no sooner are we done, we're rushing out the back door, either flying to a show that we're playing that night or driving to a show that we're playing that night. So, you know, we try to time it out if we're in New York or we're in New Jersey or somewhere within a couple hours of the show. Uh, so that that's our contact with them. But yes, yes, I have mm -hmm. I have shaken the hand of the of. Uh, and, and, you know, the other one is um, uh, Conan O'Brien. Uh, always very, very personable, uh, loves to come over and say hi to everybody. And at the time, Max Weinberg was, uh, you know, really big on the show. Uh, they featured him a lot more and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, another, another kind soul that would always come over and, and say, Hey man, what kind of drumsticks do you use? You know, I, uh, Which quick, quick aside on Matt, quick aside on Max. Uh, I met him unbeknowingly, but I met him backstage at an air supply concert. If you remember air supply? He, he was on tour with Air Supply, and I got his... Nice. <laughs> I got... Yeah, I ended up getting everybody's autograph and talking to the drummer for the longest time, and then looking back at those autographs many, many years later, I saw Max Weinberg. I'm like, oh my God, I had no idea that that was who I was kind of speaking to at such a young age that was inspiring me, that was con contributing to the inspiration of me becoming a drummer, which was super fun. So yeah, Max hits home quite nicely man um well yeah. then it must be a talk show thing with drummers because johnny carson was a drummer right and uh i think jimmy fallon is a drummer is he really and of course yeah mm -hmm. and because and then quest love is the leader of jimmy fallon's band yeah well wh why why aren't we co-hosting big shows the three of us what's going on i i'm thinking that there's something there mitch what's going on you're you're hitting legend status here why why isn't uh the the big show is contacting you to be co-host i you know what i i would i would at the drop of a hat i would love yeah. to be i'd love to be co-hosting the, the you know some of the shows i'd like to be doing i think more of the obscure shows like you know i, I always i always liked conan's show it's a great great wonderful show um i've always loved letterman's show that was always those were two shows that i just thought were 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 brilliant and you know I, you know when you when you talk about those shows uh, you know, Conan O'Brien always made an effort to acknowledge the band, right? Um, even, you know, Jimmy Fallon uh, makes an effort to acknowledge the band. Uh, Letterman always acknowledged the band. Uh, you know, Carson, I, I can't, I don't think I watched that much of Leno, uh, so I, I, I can't quite remember, but I know that Carson every night would acknowledge Doc Severinsen and, uh, of course, you know, would, would, was a Shaughnessy fan and, uh, you know, between between Buddy Rich and Louis Belson and Ed Shaughnessy, uh, it, you know, he, I think he had his, his his world cut out for him. But they always acknowledged the band, which I which I really really appreciated. Yeah, it's not just not just the famous guests, and yeah. uh, and it was always either a comedian or it was a band performing, and uh, it, you had to sit around and through all the Tom Hanks's to get to uh, the crash test dummies. So it, the inevitability. Um, Echo Drops asking, who would be the first guest on the Mitch George show? Who would? Ah, that's Jill's asking. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Who would be the first guest? Yeah. Um, Here, I'll keep that up. Yeah. Oh, there's a lot of, I, boy. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with... Uh, only because you asked me that now, right? It's it's uh, Ridley Scott. I'm going to say it would be Ridley Scott. 
Whoa. Hmm. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. Yeah, yeah. So if, if we were on the phone ready to go with a guest right now, we were to like, hey, Ridley, you available t tomorrow? Let's go. Yeah, I, 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 okay. I would go with Ridley Scott. Um, yep. That would be in the film world, of course. I think uh, going the other way, um, I would probably go with Antonio Sanchez. Um, oh. Yeah, and, and you know, and, and not, not, not because of the drum geek thing. I saw an interview with him recently where he brought up a story. Uh, he was talking about being in school and uh, and he was very, very forthcoming and talking about having his head up his ass and, uh, you know, all the things that he would do. And, and uh, they invited him to go and play in, in with the jazz band. And he showed up in the jazz band and he had all kinds of cymbals and all kinds of drums and all kinds of stuff everywhere. And how his teacher at the time just started pulling stuff away from him and saying, Here, ah. you have to make, you know, he took him down to like a four piece kit and said, you have to make this sing. So I'm going to take all this stuff away from you and I'm going to make you, you know, be a musician. And uh, it's how he, how he embraced that. And, uh, you know, I think for the full conversation, it, it wasn't talking about drums. He wasn't talking about any of those things. He, he talked about what it was like to be a human being uh, and, mm -hmm. and what, what that meant in the world and what a player was. And I just found that to be just such, such an interesting thing. And then, of course, right, then you, you go see Birdman and you go, uh, you know, only only thing human being, you know, could have done this. Um, I don't, and I, and I say that because I do think he's an interesting being. You know, who would be the other one? Well, I'd invite Tony Williams, but he'd be late. He'd be late. <laughs> he, well, we'd wait. We'd yeah. wait for him. Yeah. Uh, he's running a little late. You go to the Jimmy <laughs> Kimmel. You do the Jimmy Kimmel routine, and you're like, Tony Williams got bumped today. Um, <laughs> so we're going with somebody else today. Yeah. I think I think I find that interesting. And, I mean, it makes wow. sense. But in a lot of ways, too, one, like I was telling Paul earlier, one of my favorite interviews was uh, – uh, Billy Cobham, but not not for the drum talk. And in fact, that was the part that maybe we weren't we weren't firing on all cylinders together. Um, but when we both, one of the things that we could agree on, and this is kind of interesting, is that not agree on, but one of the things we sort of both were, Line I guess, with, on yeah. on equal footing, we'll we'll say, was we were both amateur photographers. So for me. That was, uh, as an interviewer, not talking to a legend now, talking to a fellow amateur photographer, and all of a sudden it was just easier. Um, because, again, as I think when doing stuff like this, and I've been doing stuff like this for a while, um, and, and by now I think I'm, I'm a little bit uh, lucky because my adulation button is now broken, so I don't no longer do that. I idolize my son. I adulate for him because I think he's amazing. But... That said, um, I think sometimes that gets in the way of a good interview when you're too, um, you know, maybe you're looking up as opposed to looking across. And I think that was my mistake with Billy. And then when we talked, and it just so happened because I re recall him having a camera at the Cape Breton Drum Fest that we were there together, perf not performing together, but on the same stage. And um, I just happened to know what kind it is. And I know that it's a difficult camera to use. And he just like all of a sudden we were like gabbing, which is a better place. I think and I agree. I agree with Mitch. Yeah. Like there's some there's so many interviews that I would do, but not for the drums. It's yeah. they're just I'd like to talk to the person, and it just so happens they might be a drummer. And then some of the best conversations I've had about drums are from with people who are not drummers. Um, case in point would be uh, a bass player that I used to play with, who is the worst drummer I've ever seen. But, yeah. I mean, he's such nice. a drum geek. He just knows everything about every drummer. He knows everything about every component. And I don't know why. It just it, it just interests him. And that, that to me, is an interesting conversation because, again, and I've, I've interviewed, like, Billy Sheehan and, and other uh, non-drumming musicians, and, and they're, I just find that it's actually easier to get drummy with them because they have an opinion that's not of my opinion like and you know what i mean they, they can look at it kind of from a different perspective and that they have expectations of drummers that drummers don't have of, dr of drummers you know what i mean like it's a it's a totally different ball game when you're doing that but the, um the yeah. relationship the relationship between a bass player and a drummer are are the core of any band 
Well, yeah, and yeah. and just and even like I saw an interview with Alicia Keys, and I just loved what she said. Is that in her last album, she challenged her drummer to not be a drummer. She's like, mm-hmm. can you try and use your instrument in a way that's not so typical? Like it's not kick, snare, hats. It's like, could you go beyond that? Could you transcend? Like what Mitch said that, um, uh, he the, his teacher took away his drums, um, and and he took away. I guess some of the crutches. Um, I had a I had a prolific drum teacher one time tell me that um, drum like a, your tricks your bag of tricks becomes luggage after a while, um, oh. and luggage is heavy. Oh yes, yeah, yeah. So and I've always I've always adhered to that yeah, piece of that? advice. Well, oh, some guy. I feel I feel like it's <laughs> I, I feel like it's this guy. Yeah, Did that guy. Yeah, and I would say that's one of the biggest, and that's one of the things I've always sort of kept an eye on was to make sure I'm not bringing my luggage all the time. Because to that end, too, you're always progressing. You're always different. I mean, like you said, Mitch, the 90s were great. It was an awesome time, but we're not living in the 90s anymore. And we're not, you know, unless you're a Kiss cover band or an Elvis impersonator, you can't keep living that decade. It's it's gone. But... Mm -hmm it was great and we learned and now we're moving forward. And now like I've listened to Paul McCartney's latest stuff and it's, it's awesome. I love it. Mm. The production quality is better. Paul's having more fun. Um, That doesn't take away from his Beatles stuff, but it's just not the same thing. It's, it's a different, but Paul didn't also bring the Beatles baggage to the new album either. He's Paul McCartney. Sounds Beatles. Is it, is it new? new skill set applied to like new production new world like mitch Um, have have you sorry i was going to aim it at mitch is that mm. do you find your production mindset uh in regards to like programming drums now or just having access to more than 23 tracks plus simpty um you know does do you still hold to the old styles of production i say old but you know what i mean or are you really pushing yourself to be Katy Perry production these days. Well, when it comes to, I'm, I'm an odd duck when it comes. To, I don't care whether you're using Pro Tool or what kind of compressors you're using. Um, I don't care what kind of drums you use or whether you program or whatever you do. Uh, I like to think that um, the. <clears throat> The, the, the pudding is in the performance, or the performance is in the pudding. And, uh, you know, I've I been two new years where they, where they, they've got a year of the yin yang, uh, but not a good song to be found. Um, you know, I've, yeah. I've listened to tracks that have been cool to death, and, uh, you know, I, I tend to prefer the tracks that are a little bit messier, but the, you know, the drummer takes a point in time. Nothing is a better to play listen to yourself and <laughs> listen to yourself play uh, because what you, yeah. what you thought you did and what you actually mm. did usually tend to be two different things. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's, there's there, obviously there's some wonderfully gifted people out there that, that uh, you know, what's in their minds comes out of their hands. I'm not one of them. I, I, I tend to right. have to work hard for, for everything that I do. And, uh, you know, very often, or I should say, sometimes, very often it's not the right word. Sometimes I will listen back to something that I thought I did, and it sounds like what I thought I did. And and that's, I'm beside myself when that happens. But, yeah. in, you know, in general, um, I, I like to, you know, play and, and, and see what comes up and, and make a mistake or go for something and uh you know, see, see what comes out the other side kind of a thing. So when it comes to, you know, the production value of things, uh, I see a lot of guys now that are, um, I guess they're, they're programming things. They're, 
uh, you know, they're they're going in and they're playing MIDI drums so that they can move, move things around. So they're they're still playing, but they're moving things around on on the MIDI canvas and choosing sounds. I, I, I tend to I tend to be just a little bit more organic. However, uh, I, I think that there's room for for everything. I think everybody should be able to, to jump in there and 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 make it happen. Um, yeah, I don't know. That, that kind of got a little bit away from your question there. No, Although good. Sean's nodding, or 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 he's yeah. ill, one of the two. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, I I agree completely because yeah. I I my our album because of the pandemic I, and where we live, we don't have a drum room. I've had to use electronic, but I so I've gone the other way. If I've I've used electronic to try and sound organic, um, and. In, in a lot of the ways, like for example, I'll redo the take rather than fix it mid mid middly. Is that a word? Middly. Middly. Yeah. Middly. Um, Perfect. So rather than in the in trying to be copyright, in the truest, we, we the, came yeah, up with here. We here. we did we uh, trying to be truest to the sense of the song and the and the performance. My performance is, I've sat up and shed for six hours to make sure I can play that like that part. I was like, okay, I can yeah. hear it in my head, but I can't do it right now. So I just need to learn how to do it and then record it. So rather than like just fixing it middly, yep. I actually did went back and re re recorded it. On the flip side of that, there's been a couple of times where I didn't know what I was, I was not coming up with what I thought was going to sound good. And in fact, like Mitch said, like what you sort of laid down is like maybe not, it's not your best take or what you thought, you know, what you laid down actually doesn't work for the part. And in slicing up a few things to see, it kind of took me away from the drum stool and put me in the production seat where I then wasn't engaged as the player. I was now looking at it from a different aspect and, and making some mistakes again, because I had to learn how to do all this stuff. I kind of by accident shifted things and went, Oh wait, what's that? That would be cool. Yeah. So then I would paste stuff together and say, okay, that's what I'm going to play. And then I would take that upstairs and I would learn it. And then much like um, Zorro used to say, he would take some of Bobby's music and some of the, the uh, music, uh, analog music, uh, digital, or sorry, some of the drum machine stuff that Bobby would record and Zorro would learn how to play it uh, yeah. on drum on drums. And he said it made me a better player because now I was coming up with things that I wouldn't have thought of. Whereas, so when you can do that, and as, as, as one time, as my wife knows, I used to work at, at CKX television, um, I I found working in the editing suite as a video editor, and like we had to sh do a week of shooting. As so, I was an ENG photographer for news, and then two weeks of shooting, and then we had to be in the studio for a week to edit everyone else's stuff. And every shooter that went through that said, "I I became a better shooter because I had to be in the editing suite for a week oh, and yeah. seeing all the shit that we used to come up with, what what we thought looked good." Um, and I never, now more than ever, I mean, especially that way, I know it's not drumming related, but it, to me, I've always thought that experience has always taught me like, as far as music goes, yeah. keep it simple, whatever you want to say. It's just like when you edit, when you produce, you just learn your drumming, guitar, vocal, flautist, harpist, whatever you play better. you just become a better player. Yeah. Um, it, Mitch will get this entirely is that there's um, uh, how do I say this there's a less pressure now and so much more spotlight back in the day on pre-production and we we would spend uh, a year longer pre-production before going in the studio fine-tuning the tunes so that you could go in and nail it and the, the producer would have a vision of how the trajectory of that session should occur. And nowadays, there's less pressure on that. Hey, come in, try some drum tracks. I'll, I'll grab eight bars, and if it sounds good, I'll go for it. I'm not saying that's wrong. It's just a form of production. I still personally value a lot of pre-production. Mitch, do you feel the same? Like, I really like to be prepared before I press record, you know? Yeah, I mean, I, absolutely. I, for full songs. I can't say that I that I that I subscribe to any right or wrong way of mm. doing things. I, I think at the end of the day, if your canvas has the picture or a picture that is moving people in some way, then mission accomplished. Yeah. However, having said that, 
um, you know, along with the you know, miracle of the of the digital age, and and I'll I'll use you know Pro Tools just because it's the in industry standard. There there really is, and, and without a doubt, I mean, it's, we're not guessing here. There really is a feeling that most people can just walk in. And I'm, I'm, you know what, if I give you 70% or if I give you 100%, like, I, you know, I, you, know we'll, we'll just, you can just fix it. Yeah. And, and uh, I, I, I think that one should always go for the, you don't have to fix it. I think, you know, not having to fix it, it I think, is, is a great way to go. Um, and, and so, you know, the pre-production uh, brings you into that realm, I think, of not having to fix it. Because the, the, the pre-production has you playing with your bass player, has you playing with your keyboard player, it's the it's and, and the guitar player, it's the smiles, it's the mm -hmm. it's the interaction between people that creates the moment, right? I mean, something I've I've always harped on my entire life is that when you go to see a band or a musician or an actor or whatever, but I'm gonna use a band the people in that room at that particular point in time are experiencing a unique one-time thing and whatever happens in that room uh, and and hopefully the goal is to have magic in that room even if you recorded it you wouldn't the the magic wouldn't play back if it did wow that's really transcending the whole thing but in general the, the, the magic that happens in that room is experienced by the people that are in that room. And when you're doing pre-production and you're creating that space, you're creating that, that little bit of a lag of time or, or the, you know, you're looking over the guitar player and the guitar player looks at you and, you know, the bass player is, is, is watching you. You're watching the bass player. It, the, the song sits a certain way. And uh, you, you just don't get that when when there's no pre-production everybody comes in and you play a part and the part might be right but i don't know that the part would ever be as good as when it's all played together or, or played with the same mindset right? right and that's i mean and that's why when you look at albums like four and more miles davis uh, everybody was in the studio everybody played everybody was on the same page right mm -hmm. uh, and, and a lot of the albums now again you want to go back and you want to look at the, the at the times because it's really cool that one guy can be in Paris, one guy can be in in Victoria, another guy can be in Nashville, and one guy could be in China, and and uh, you know that you can put it all together and you can play in this new digital age and you can combine it. If at the end of the day you've made something artistic and wonderful, that's fantastic. But um, you know just to to uh, replaster what you've already said. Uh, that pre-production, I think, is what gives the music that little special thing when you when you do get into the studio. And without it, I, I, I think you're just negating an option. Maybe it's not, you know, maybe it wouldn't be the best option. Maybe you would go in and, and maybe it wouldn't be the right thing. But you're really taking away an option. Mm -hmm. You know you've played it before, so it may or may not work. You, yeah. The luggage we were talking about, you're actually packing your luggage before going in the studio, I guess. <laughs> or knowing what not to bring. Well, yeah. good answer. Good yeah. answer, yeah. Because yeah. I'm sure you and Dan were definitely, like, connecting and locking as a rhythm section, um, you know, during those pre-production times enough that guitarists, I think we know, we'll just redo the guitar part, but as long as the bass and drums are solid, then that's 90% of the studio time taken care of, right? Yeah, I, I've been really lucky in, in uh, a lot of the projects that I've worked with. I've, I've really, really been like over the top lucky of having bass players that were human beings and had big ears. And mm. Dan is definitely one of them. Dan is always, his, his ears are always open at the end of every night, every show that we've ever played, anything we've ever done in the studio, he'll always come over and say, hey, that one shot that you do, or mm. or this this one note that I play, like you know, it'll either be catch it or leave it alone or whatever. But he knows, and and again, a lot of the bass players that I've played with in my life, they all come to me the same way, saying, mm. "Hey, can you catch this?" Or I didn't hear you do that little fill last night. Are you going to do it again tonight? Because if you did, I want to catch it. 
because I think it's I was, when you did it last night, it was something that was really cool that I want to catch with that. Or, you know, they're, they're the voice of reason and they say, Phil, that you played last night. Yeah, don't ever play that again. Right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Eight bars of triplet 16s. N no, we're fine. Don't worry about it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well done. Or how many times do you uh, need to hit the splash symbols that were big through the 90s as well? Because I think everybody owns lots of splash symbols. Uh, that sounds good. Um, yeah, those were those were the times. Especially uh, pre-production for me is is kind of a big deal. So that's that's good. And I'm trying to hearken that to a lot of younger producers and engineers that I'm working with is preparation of knowing what you're getting into before you get into the studio. Uh, Sean knows. Um, I used to work for Roland for many years. And one of my favorite stories I like telling is that um, I have witnessed a child sit behind an acoustic drum set, hit it, and go, oh my goodness, that's loud. What, what, how do I turn down the volume on this? Or how do I, one kid was like, how do I change the sound of this for the snare? And what we've realized is that Jaggers is going to be a prime example with that electronic drum kit behind you there, uh, Sean, that... A child's first musical instrument right now is a digital instrument, whether yep. that's piano, whether that's drums, whether that's guitar. A lot of the time, kids are gravitating right towards uh, electric instruments, and it seems like people of our ilk are still grabbing onto nostalgia and reasoning why you'd want to get a certain LM402 snare drum versus a, you know, a Pearl Eliminator pedals. Like what we grab onto that and. I do feel, at least throughout my tenure at Roland, there was less pressure and celebration. That's the word I'm looking for. Less celebration of gear with the younger generation. How do you feel? How do you both feel about that? I, I yeah, I mean, I think uh, the whole term of gearhead is t different now. It's less gearhead and software that we talk about different plugins, different VSTs, um, you know, I, you know, someone could care less about this symbol than, you know, my first K dry K ride. Oh my God, that sounded so sweet. Um, and I, I don't know, again, I think it's the Downton Abbey thing is it's, it's, that's your revolution that you're, you're we just extrapolated all the bronze and wood and lacquer and this into now it's bits and bytes and it's, it's software. And I, th I think it's all relevant. I think, Again, I mentioned last night, Paul, about how DS drums, Luca, who makes it f the Ferrari of drums in my mind, um, he's an Italian craftsman who just makes beautiful wood drums and has understood the progressiveness of the industry. And he's made and paid for a VST package where he, you can now buy his drums via a VST package you know, called DS Drums Live or something. And I think that's important. And, and yeah, Jagger, definitely his first instrument was actually a MIDI piano. And a, and a microphone and a camera. So I don't know what I'm creating, but um, a, relevant, basic... a relevant child in the world <laughs> of 2022. That's what definitely a you yeah. definitely probably a YouTuber. But perfect. I also yeah. I also think it's like the pendulum um, thing where we, we sort of have to go to the extremes before we get to a middle. And I think as, as the more we go to the digital side and I, I think that's relevant, I think we, we are supposed to. Uh, that's the way that music's going to survive. That's the way the expression's going to survive. The fact that maybe kids who couldn't maybe just because a kid can't read or do the Moeller method doesn't mean he's not musical. It, it just, or she, it, it just means that the, the, the barrier there is, is harder for them. Like think about in the seventies, if you, if you couldn't get into a studio and, and do your job properly, there's no way for you to be a musician. And now the barrier is is not quite as big and hmm. no i'm not i'm not certainly not saying that i i subscribe to like you know uh, pitch pitch correction and that but perhaps the next uh mozart exists but they're not necessarily talented technically maybe their mind is talented in a different way and i hmm. feel like digital allows for a, a the, the 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 new hip word is inclusion and i and i believe that i fully believe that um but i also don't think we can rest on our laurels and say well you know it's good you know jagger doesn't need to learn theory i would subscribe to if that were jagger's path i would say i think you should learn it i think you should know it um you know know the rules before you break them 
touch a you know play a snare drum no no why uh tony williams touch was different than jeff precaro's touch or 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 why you know what makes fool in the rain sound so goddamn good is it the squeakiness of bonham's pedal or is or is it the fact that he's not that he pushes and pulls a lot and i i found that as a challenge as a drum teacher a few years ago that we yes we're losing the 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 technique of the stick with more or french german all that you know the boring stuff kids don't want to do and yet those are the tools that makes like Antonio Sanchez so fucking good is that he understands it at that level. If, if you could call it a molecular level is where I remember, I think maybe I'm not sure, Mitch, if you were at that drum fest was Weco. No, Weco wasn't there. You were there. Um, but Dave watched a number of players and each one at the, t when we were talking, he was able to identify, well, I saw you going for that, this, and if all you did was just like turn your wrist and open up totally. this, you'd be able to access that part that you wanted to get to, but you just weren't able to do that. So I think that's the other side is that when you can address those things with these kids that are learning the digital thing that they're getting into the arena easier is that, Hey, you know what though? If you, if you were to learn your G skill, you, the notes you would have access to, or, or in, you know, learn the different, uh, uh, inversions of that skill you know what i mean like it, it just you open their world to a bigger um i remember a kid that i was teaching and i showed him how he could steal his bounce he could he doesn't need to go bop, bop, that you you could get the second one for free yeah. you just had to adjust your technique and it just it blew his mind and then he would just sit there and go bah, da, 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 da. all of a sudden he just he got into it but it was the way i framed it and i had to make it accessible to him i couldn't couldn't sit there and go now this is the german grip and this is right. french and this is american and some guy named gene krupa came, came up with like it has no bearing to that person mm -hmm. um it's a question of how can i get you to you know like uh bob the painter guy the the Afro bob ross painter. bob ross oh yeah I mean, the uh, man's all about he's he's a he's a prime example of technique and artistry. Like he just there's no barrier for him because he knew the rules. He knew how to do it. Yeah. And I think I don't think that it's wrong that you that you can get into the game and maybe not know everything. I don't think Dead Mouse knows necessarily how to play drums, but he certainly knows how to program drums. Yeah. And his last concert, I think he sold like before the pandemic, I think he sold out madison square garden three for three days so i mean i don't know someone's listening to him and someone's getting it yeah yeah I, we, we went all around there mitch do you, do you have an idea of kids these days uh, have their first electronics being their first touch um yeah, that might be the case uh, yeah. most people I, I i get the phone call as we all do i get the phone call that says hey is or or Jeanette is old enough now, and I was thinking that I'd like to get them into some drums. Uh, you know, should I get them into acoustic drums or should I buy some electronic drums? And my response is always the same. Um, if you're if you're going to sit down and you're going to play a beat or you're going to play your best fills or you're going to do those things, then you know whatever is easiest for you. But if you're going to explore sound, mm -hmm. um, I think that it's majorly important that you understand that there's the way a drum works is it's a reaction to your effort. Mm -hmm. And when you with the, the kind of stick that you have, the kind of drum heads that you have, the kind of swing that you have, the humidity in the room, the closeness of the walls or the distance yeah. of the walls, all have an effect on how something is going to sound. So it's not that you're creating a beat or that you're creating music, but you're manipulating sound. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, drums in particular is a, a, is, is a major mover when it comes to manipulating sound. Uh, you know, how, how much sound can you get out of a cymbal? Uh, how much sound can you get out of a bass drum? I mean, if you're just going to stomp on it all the time, then what difference does it make? But when you sit down, and, and I have, the other reaction I have is, is when I watch people 
if you if you put a set of drums anywhere and just leave a set of six on them, whether it's in the World Trade Center or at a school, whatever, yeah. people are going to go and some people are going to sit down. They're going to rock out. Other people are going to timidly pick up a stick and, and hit something and they get a sound out of it. And mm -hmm. and I for me personally, that is what drums are to me. It's it's a manipulation of sound. It's the effort that I put in and what do I get back out of it? And, mm -hmm. you know, that's why when I'm playing with with a trio, that I'm I'm not whacking things. I'm I'm looking for tone. I'm looking for the kind of response that I'm getting from a symbol. Whereas, if you know, if if you're in, I remember uh, Terry Bozio once was was criticized for using rototoms, uh, in in uh, I think it was missing persons. Missing that he yeah. And uh, you know, and he said, "Well, I'm in an arena. Like all you're hearing is the impact. I could have like the the finest." A crafted drum in the entire world and 60 feet out that's going to mean nothing to anybody and if you're 200 feet and you're in the back of the room that's not going to mean anything to anybody right. uh, yeah. so there's that situation uh, but that's not the situation when you're sitting down in your room or in your living room your basement a studio wherever it is that you are you're you're creating sound you're manipulating sound and i and i, yeah. and I think that that's what we're missing when we when we say to kids here you can play an electronic drum or you can play this uh, and you know something that's electronic is is giving you um i guess a projected predicted response mm -hmm. but when you're playing a, an instrument uh you know like a cymbal what you know if you if you go to hit it one way and you're and the beat of your stick and the shoulder of your stick hits this hit the cymbal at the same time it sounds considerably different than what it is yeah. so it's about creating sound and sound and then if you can yeah. take those sounds and then mine them into something coherent now we're creating you know we're creating music and then you know the space that we put between sounds etc 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 you know where i'm going with that so yeah uh yeah the electronic age is is great uh jagger's gonna you know have have those things to hit but what we need to do is is we need to have things so that you can learn about what sound is, right? And that's hitting the cardboard box, hitting the pot, hitting the stove, hitting your dad's yeah. head. Uh, however you're manipulating sound is, is I yeah. think, is the way to go. Well, and even I would say, too, like um, one, of the, one of the things that I personally discovered uh, having the opportunity as a youngster to have a drum set set up and uh, my teacher, uh, my first drum teacher, Doug Yonason, um, who to me was probably one of the best guys I think I could have ever had to, teaching me is Doug was uh, limited in his abilities to play because he, he lacked his fingers only grew to the first knuckle. So, oh, wow. so Doug, Doug was sort of forced to play as, as a as a sort of a traditional style. But it also there's things that Doug had to overcome. And uh, one of the things Doug really, really put into my head, A, was he played the cowbell when, whenever I played and just to, to know the quarter. But also he, he challenged me to use brushes, to use, we used mallets, we used root, uh, the sort of the precursor to what roots were. Uh, we used um, cup, uh, like rudimentary sort of uh, these wood things that he had sort of come up with. And I just... I really became sort of came to appreciate the organicness of that, that it, the, what it, to make a drum sound good with brushes is a different set of skills than to make a drum sound good, say with a pair of five A's. And then, and then, and even I, I, I talked with Vic Firth at PASIC, uh, 2012 about, um, timpani playing. And I mean, that's the, He's like talking about pulling the sound out of the bottom of the drum. Like, and you're just like, oh man, there's so much I don't know about drumming. <laughs> and, and, you know, he's just the master at it. That's what he's known for, you know, it, it, and the, t the technique that he lived in that French grip world and to pull mel melody out of that just threw me on a whole other tangent now that I've, I'm still working on. Um, so, yeah, I think. Sorry, I, I know you got, you got to get going. Sean, so yeah, in like um, in a couple minutes. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, uh, I, I don't want to uh, go overboard on that. Um, uh, I, I'm a, I'm a student of improvisational music, so much like Antonio San Sanchez. Um, um, so 
you know, Mitch hearkened to it before, where everything gets taken away. I'm a big fan of using bows on symbols, uh, different implements, mm. whether it's sandpaper, whether it's, uh, you know, a, a little piece of metal that I can create different tonalities out of with different types of mallets in which I have. Um, and then working in an ensemble where time is not important. It's about the right. dynamics. Uh, and Mitch, once again, said it before, it's about the silence as well, right? Um, and all having all those implements in front of you, whether it's a drum or a piece of metal or it's a bucket or it's your, your physical body, um, mm. it's all forms of expression. And, um, and, and the three of us do that comfortably, I guess. I well, yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> I like I, my best my best uh, example of of something that you just brought up, Paul. The uh, ex uh, experimental is uh, across the universe soundtrack. Yeah. When they did, they showed how they got the bass sound for come together, mm -hmm. and it was literally rubbing a rubber ball against the the body of the bass to actually get to emulate boom boom. Ba -da -da -da. Totally. Which was very interesting was using a stand up bass to get the sound, but not in the way you would think that they would use the stand up yeah, bass, yeah. which is. It's uh, it's interesting. I'm, I'm part of some ensembles where we'll put a movie up on the screen and then with no sound and then just as an ensemble, you're performing what you feel is. And you've got a conductor telling you dynamically and when when to yeah. come in and whatever. But you. Um, um, yeah, you're you're performing and and once again, Mitch said it before, is nobody will ever hear that again. It is what it is. Mm -hmm. You know, nobody will have experienced it the way that the people sitting in front of you will have experienced it. And it can't be expressed on tape. It can't be expressed in however. So there's lots of different facets to creation and being creatives. Um, yeah. You know, and, and uh, just, just as a side note, just as you bring that up, if, if, if either of you have not seen, uh, you should. Uh, is uh, and, and I can't uh, off the top of my head I can't remember what it was but it was Mickey Hart and it was all about the creation of the soundtrack for Apocalypse Now oh yeah yeah right. and oh, uh, oh, yeah. you know and, and that's it's you just had a just a, a massive studio with everything from kitchen sinks to, yeah. to uh, and, and they just they got a bunch of people in there it wasn't just Mickey Hart it was a bunch of people and I, I think a lot of the Grateful Dead people and uh, you know they 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 just went for hours and hours and days and weeks, mm -hmm. creating just like creating sounds and creating things. Uh, if mm -hmm. you haven't seen it, it's 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 quite interesting. I, I it's not called, called Heart of Darkness. I can't remember what it's called, but uh, I, I just you know just Google you know Apocalypse Now soundtrack and I'm sure it'll come up. Um, cool. But you know, we'll post that link. Yeah. what's that? We'll post the link in the Good. interview here. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the show the show I really enjoyed watching is Hannibal. If you've ever watched that, the soundtrack to that is the the, the same type of orchestrations, the same type of um, tonalities and improvisation, and it it was one of the best soundtracks to a, a show that I think I've ever experienced. So yeah, yeah. Um, just quick side note, just because Sean brought it up earlier, and I yeah. and 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 it, it's it kind of ties everything together for me. Um, one of one of the people. I, I've, I've been fortunate to make some really good friends in life and, uh, and some of them, you know, uh, f come from a, a direction you just wouldn't think. So um, one of those friends of, of mine, that a very cherished friendship that I have is, is with Billy Cobham. Mm. And, uh, and, and it has zero to do with drums. Absolutely zero. Mm -hmm. you know, growing up, was I a fan of the Mahavishnu Orchestra, et cetera, et cetera? Absolutely. But yeah. I was in Los Angeles, and my friend Jim Firmston said to me, "Hey, Mitch, I'm going down to the club today. I don't know if you knew this, but the Cobman is a big is a big squash player, and you know, why don't you come down and we'll play? I'm a big time squash player. I, I, it's, oh, I cool. love playing. So you know, I we I go down to the LA Athletic Club, and and uh, and and there's Billy, and uh, and I'm thinking, wow, this is this is you know, it's Billy Cobb, one of my heroes. But we get on the squash court and and uh and there's there's no talk billy and i have spent probably you know over the years you know 80 hours in each other's presence right uh, and and i think we've probably talked drums about 10 minutes 
in, in, in <laughs> totally. In yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, I, you know, it's all about the, the human being, but yep. one of the things that we did talk about was something that we've kind of touched on already. And that's that when you're on a squash court and you're, and you're, you're playing and in your mind, you are the athletes you that, that are worthy of everything that the Greeks thought you should be. If you put a camera outside and, and you watch what you, what you actually look like, yeah. it, it's like watching a bunch of gibbons yeah. you know, run, run around the court. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and, and you, you come off court and you have this, this idea of, of, you know, oh, I, I look like this or I look like that or I look like the athletes, I look like the professionals. And you get back and, and you watch it and, and you, you cry. And you, yeah. you say, oh, I'm never going to get on a squash court again. And, 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 and the same thing comes from when you go into the studio, you, you play, you know, you, you, you play your thing. You, you play the, the 18 licks that you really know, and you yeah. play the other 18 that you think you know, and then you try for the other ones. But you listen back to it, and, and, and you say to yourself, you know, what was I thinking? What, where where <laughs> was I going? Yeah. Because you know, that's certainly not what I was listening to in my head. Yeah. And I, I take both those experiences and – because I, it's, the theme has come up a few times in the conversations that we've had, um, and you know, and I look at those things and I say, at, at what point are, are we using this information to get better? Um, right. mm -hmm. And I don't mean to, I don't mean to say to get better in terms of where someone comes along and says, "Hey, you're a really good drummer." Mm -hmm. uh, no, how are we using these situations to get better in order to develop a vocabulary so we can express ourselves better as as musicians? And um, those are the kinds of conversations that I've had with, you know, I mean, I've, I've, some people would say, uh, you know, how lucky are you? You know, I've been wrapped with Dom Familaro for you know, weeks. Uh, because we were both, the, the, you know, the, we were the teaching facility when we were in Germany. And, uh, and, but our conversations were never about drums. They were about, you know, becoming better learners, becoming better expressionists of, uh, about yeah. the things that we do. Uh, I've had those same conversations, you know, in a bar in Austria with Terry Bosio, uh, right. for, you know, the three hour conversation where the, the, the idea of drums never came up, but it's how can we look at what we do to become better at expressing who we are and, and, and what we are. And I, and I, right. That comes down to, you know, is it electronic drums? Is it, uh, you know, a piece together where we're slicing things up and, and we're making mistakes? Is it because we're playing electronic drums or because we're playing acoustic instruments? Uh, just all of those things that, that come in. And I think when we, when, we, when we get together like this and we have these conversations, those are the things that come up. And, and I, I would pray that more people would be doing so that I, I could go to YouTube and just not watch everybody play really fast and hit yeah. everything. Right. Yeah, agreed. Agreed. You know? agreed. You've, uh, Sorry, you've I hit... just had to get off my chest. No, no. Yeah. As, as a matter of fact, it couldn't be more perfect because Sean knows, and, and we'll, we'll wind it up with this. How about this? Sean knows that at every drum clinic that I've ever attended, yeah. Sean, you know where I'm going with this. I love your question. Thank you. Every drum clinic I ever go to, I always ask the same question. And I'm kind of, and within this series, I'm going to ask it near the end of every every uh, chat that I've got. So I'm asking you, Mitch. This is it. This is the big question I ask. It's easy to put our heroes up on pedestals, but they seem more human when we see them fail. So can you tell us something, and it can be drum related or undrum drum related, can you tell us something that you have not perfected so that we can hear about you failing at it and maybe the challenges uh, or how you're challenging yourself to overcome that? Uh, well, it's a daily thing for me. It really is. Uh, I, and, I, and, I, and I say that it's daily because I have many fingers and many pies on a, on a, on a daily basis. And, uh, you know, for instance, I've been doing voiceovers all day today. Mm -hmm. And every time that I do a voiceover, I, I go back and I listen to it and I say, that sucks. And, and how, what, what can I do to make it better? How can I, what's, what's my intonation? What's the inflection? What's all these kinds of things? And then I sit down and then I'll, I do the same thing 
uh, you know, I'll, I'll go and I'll, I'll, I'll tackle a, a drum thing. And it's a live drum thing. <laughs> I'm not talking about here. I'll, I'll be going, I'll be, and I'll, and I'll play and I'll, and I'll realize um, that my, my hands aren't doing what my, my brain is telling it to do. And so what I have to do is I have to back up and then I end up kind of playing safe. Uh, and, you know, and that, and that happens more than I care to admit, but, um, that also crosses over when I'm on the squash court and, and I'm, and I work at something and then all of a sudden, you know, I try it and I, I just, you know, I'm, I'm the lost gibbon in, 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 in the court. And, um, what I do hope in, in all of that is that I never lose the desire to, to make those mistakes. Um, awesome. I, I, I'd rather, I'd rather make the mistake and, and pull back a little bit because I'm, I, I feel embarrassed that I tried something and it didn't work. Uh, when I stop doing that, uh, that that's going to be that's going to be a problem. Um, and I, and I and I think that anybody out there that makes the claim that that they've got it figured out, um, they, they've lost touch with yeah. what it what it what it really is. Yep. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. It does. Yeah, it, but, it absolutely does. And but Sean, really, yeah. Sean knows, especially when you're at a drum clinic, when I ask a drummer who has, and you, and you know, you, you've you certainly done lots of uh, engagement with uh, education and clinics, that you, you try to perfect your performance. You don't go outside of your boundary of skill because you want to give your best for the audience, of course, right? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of why I asked that question is because when you see really, you know, in the eyes of the audience, like super top tier drummers, messing up drum fills or trying to do a certain samba and just messing it up all the time it's relatable yeah. they re you realize that you're we're all on the same journey and we all have the same challenges and maybe just other people handle those challenges a little bit differently so i'm, I'm your your answer is perfect yeah, yeah. don't it, don't it, lose it, don't lose the uh the passion even if you get beaten down a tiny bit right yeah, and it really is up to your skill set, right? Uh, and and I, I think we all have the option to play within our skill set, and uh, and that's a really comfortable way to go. But the, you know, um, I always tell people that I'm I'm climbing I'm climbing the mountain and I'm on top of the mountain, and to, for me, being on top of the mountain is not is not a goal that's been accomplished. Uh, when I get to the top of the mountain, what it does is it lets me see across the valley to the next mountain I got to climb. Yeah. And, and so you have to descend down into the valley and you have to climb all over again. And when you're descending down and you're climbing up, there's a whole learning process that, that has to take place again. And when you get to the top of the next mountain, you look across and you see there's another mountain. And, you know, the goal is never make it to the top of the mountain. The goal is to make it to the summit so you can see what the next goal is going to be. <laughs> Right. Brilliant. Uh, but, Brilliant. But you, can, you can get up to the top of the mountain and you can assume the gurus or the, the yogi position and you can say, I've, I've attained enlightenment. I'm on top of the mountain. And in which case you've stopped growing and, and, and we need to we need to go so much further than that. So, uh, you know, that's you know, we, we can go on forever, I guess, with metaphors. Yeah. Um, you know, um, that's, uh, that's phenomenal. Yeah. You know. And, 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 and uh, <laughs> it's, it's funny uh, because we say our, what our, whatever our skill set is. And, and, and a number of years ago, I went to a drum clinic. I, I'm not going to mention the drummer's name because it's not important. But what is important is that that drummer happens to be uh, you know, a high-profile drummer doing a, a drum clinic. And, and uh, I, there was all kinds of odd time signatures and, and, you know, talk about, you know, hoops and perfectly tuned drums and cymbals and how the blah, blah, blah. And when it was, when it was question and answer period, uh, a young boy in the front who, for, for whatever reason, whatever, whatever his reason was, he put up his hand and, and he said, yeah. And, and I think he was expecting a question of how do you play in 12, eight or, or, and, and, and he said, what kind of sticks do you use? And, and, uh, and he laughed, you know, and, and I, and I felt, I, I, I felt that this, that was, that was just so wrong. Why, why are you laughing that for that person at that point in time, that was the question he, you know, he was seeing what you did and he thought that if he ran out and got this kind of drumsticks that you have, that he's going to play as good as you, yeah. but, 
but instead you, you laughed and, and you humiliated them. Um, it, it takes a lot of courage to speak to your heroes as well. Right? Exactly. Yeah. And, and you've got to ask the questions that you're, that you're, that you're hearing in your head or that you have the curious or that someone else might say, Oh, that's a dumb question. There is no dumb question. You know, uh, it, it's, it's about humility. It's, it's about all those kinds of things. And those, you know what, when I sit down with, with, with my heroes, the, the Don Famularos, uh, uh, you know, the Sean Mitchells, the, uh, the, you know, the Terry Bozios, the, you know, all, all these people that I managed to meet in my life. That's what it's all about. It's, it's about, you know, climbing the next mountain. It's, it's about being all that you can be. I, I rarely, rarely has it ever been about the, the, the most accurate paradiddle. Man, you're right. <laughs> You're right. That's true. I think I think that's a great way to end her up here because, uh, yeah, Sean's got to get going. But uh, we we've been going almost two hours here, and Mitch, it's been awesome to get to know you. This has been great. Thank you. Likewise, it's yeah. I I don't know. <clears throat> I don't know if I'll ever be able to speak with people with hair again. But <laughs> no, never again. No, no, no. What? This is the pinnacle. This is that mountain that you were talking about. And then when you go down, hair gets longer. And then as you, as you come back up, you reassociate yourself with, uh, with the Vikings, if you know what I mean. Yeah. You know, if I could grow hair, I wouldn't. <laughs> yeah. You're, I, oh my goodness. We could talk for hours. Um, we talked some, we talked drums today. We talked off drums today, but more importantly, I was just getting to know you, Mitch. This is awesome. We're going to do this again. And we're going to talk about what your favorite breakfast cereal is, or we're going to talk about the obscurities of life. That's what we're going to talk about next time. Cool. I'm always a phone call away or, or an email away or a text away or oh, Sean on a mountain going or whatever. That's, awesome. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> Mitch, I'm, I'm going I'm to take you out here. Um, I really, really appreciate you uh, hanging I'm out gone. with us today. Yep. Thanks a lot uh, for being at least a bit interested in talking to me. Oh, I love it, dude. Uh, we'll, we'll touch base soon, okay? Okay. Cheers, buddy. Bye. Love you, man. There you go. Hey, hey. Well, he's a cool guy. Very cool. I guess he can. I guess uh, he can hang around us other cool guys. I guess. Yeah, you know, yeah. He, like I said, yep. surround myself with talented people. That's the right answer, man. I learned a lot today. That was a lot of fun. Thank you. It was fun. Yeah. Um. Well. Um. Why don't we? Why don't we end her up here? Um, yep. I'll say very very quickly here. Um, shoot. Let's do this, and then uh, for anybody who's watching right now. Um, this is kind of the inaugural. Remember, I was trying to use that word at the beginning. This is the inaugural yeah, stream. Inaugural. Yeah. Going into um, some awesome streams that we've got coming up. We've got Liberty DeVito happening on January uh, 29th, uh, 5.30 PST. Dom Famulero, February 1st at 5 p.m. PST. Uh, and then uh, Thomas Lang at uh, on February 5th, 1 p.m. And, you, and we've got more on the go. There's more, yeah. There's more coming. But for the moment, uh, this is... Uh, cool people doing cool stuff and i wasn't yeah. joking i wonder if thomas lang does play mario kart because that'd be fun too so we'll he could that. answer that for you he could probably answer that question for <laughs> that's right but we uh we appreciate everybody hanging out with us today uh sean i appreciate uh us doing our cool stuff today yeah. cool fun. yeah okay well let's uh close her up and see you guys later cool see you guys later yeah you can hit her have a good day everybody and we'll see you again soon cheers <laughs>